Good afternoon, guys. I am somewhere north of London right now, but I'm headed to Liverpool for a very special event commemorating what I hope to be 90,000 subscribers. You may recall that I was going to be blowing some stuff up in celebration of that event, so please subscribe if you haven't done already and share these videos with your friends. Hopefully, we can climb the rest of that hill up to 90K. All right, so we're on to part two of our space station showdown. If you haven't watched part one, by the way, stop this video right now and go back to part one, which covers Star Lab being built by NanoRack, so you can decide which space station should be the next ISS. So for those of you who have watched that first episode, I had an opportunity to really go in depth on the Sierra Space and Blue Origin Orbital Reef Station because I had an opportunity to interview the president of Sierra Space, Dr. Janet Cavandi. Dr. Cavandi has a very long and storied history with NASA. She's served as a director, deputy director in Cleveland and Houston. Uh, she also has won a variety of different decorations, including the NASA uh, Distinguished Service Medal, which is the most prestigious award that you can receive from NASA. And on top of that, she flew three shuttle missions, one of which you're watching right now, STS-104. I can't think think of too many other people who are more qualified to lead Sierra Space or indeed to talk about living in space on a space station, and I had an opportunity to interview her in depth. So instead of listening to me anymore, let's get right to it. All right, guys, so I finally caught up with Sierra Space at long last, getting an opportunity to talk about Orbital Reef, which really we haven't done in depth up to this point. Thank you so much for joining us. Please, if you could introduce yourself to the viewers. I am Janet Cavandi, and I am president of Sierra Space. So yeah, we've we've reached the uh, the top of the pecking order at this point, guys. I'd, once again, very honored that you've decided to give your time to us today. So tell me about um, Orbital Reef was one of a number of different competitors, and and some have have won, you know, in terms of replacements for the space station. What is it that makes Orbital Reef, for example, SpaceX wasn't approved for their Starship, you know, Starbase kind of solution? So what made Orbital Reef, you know, the winner in that whole competition? Well, in my opinion, I think it's our flexibility. Uh, we have multiple types of modules that we can use in space. We have our life, which is an inflatable habitat, uh, and it's very large. You can take it up in a small five meter fairing and inflate it into a 30, 30 foot diameter module. Uh, we also have the ability to take hard shell modules, uh, like what Blue Origin is planning to put up and perhaps Boeing. Uh, we have multiple types of space transportation systems, uh, including the Dream Chaser, which can bring up cargo and crew. And then we have other options, such as the CST-100. So the partnership um, between Blue and, and Sierra, the, the primary partners, allows us to launch on New Glenn, fly on Dream Chaser, go to a station that we both have modules with. We have a modular um, type design so that we continue to add modules as we grow. So all of that adds some flexibility that I feel no one else has. So um, a question that I've asked before, this is about a year ago, I guess, um, when we were talking about launch providers for the station and such, your life modules are five meter fairing um, compatible, but what Blue Origin is doing is a seven meter, more in correspondence with New Glenn, which has yet to fly and BE4 has yet to be proven as an engine too. Um, do you feel comfortable with that, number one? And number two, do you have contingencies in case there are issues with New Glenn? 
Uh, of course, we have many options for launch. We don't have our own launch provider. Uh, currently, we are under contract with ULA's uh, Vulcan rocket, which does has the, have the BE-4 engines. So we will be flying on BE-4s for our first flight. Uh, for the first six missions, we are under contract with them. From our seventh mission and anything beyond that, we are essentially up for grabs. We are going to compete our, our next provider. Um, the advantage of New Glenn is that it is a larger diameter fairing so that we can even build a larger life module than we currently have planned. Uh, so we can get even bigger uh, with a launch. We can carry, of course, more cargo, the bigger the rocket, uh, but we are not confined to any particular launch vehicle. We can also launch internationally. We could launch on a Japanese vehicle or the Ariane 6. We could launch um, perhaps on a, on a SpaceX, a version of SpaceX. So there's just lots of options and that gives us a lot of flexibility. In addition to the launch provider, if we were to launch in another country, we could land in another country as well, since we can land pretty much anywhere with a you know 8,000 to 10,000 foot runway. Now I spoke to, um, I toured uh, Spaceport Cornwall just a little while ago, um, and we talked a lot about Dream Chaser. They regard that as being a big win. And I also discussed, and this is a thing I brought up actually with both organizations now, the possibility of Europe you know, getting a dream chaser, essentially. So in other words, launching on an Ariane 6, for example, landing at Spaceport Cornwall and dream chaser becoming part of the European uh, spaceflight community. Do you see that being possible? Oh, absolutely possible. And, and it's not just Europe. I mean, we can do Middle East. We could do, you know, the Far East. We could do San Central or South America. Any countries that have the runway capability and want to provide launch capability, or even if they don't have launch capability, we can still land in another country, take their astronauts up, bring them back home to their home country, and then transport our vehicle back, back to Florida for processing. That's very exciting. Okay, another question. Um, we just did the pressure test. I got the opportunity to report on that uh, as it was released. Thank you for that. Um, the, the whole pressure test, the, uh, the amount of pressure you subjected the module to was five times what the usual pressure test is for a module. What's next to prove that inflatable will work and to make everybody trust it? Because there does seem to be a trust issue of inflatable versus a solid metal module. Well, we have a second burst test coming up, so we'll do even a, a higher pressure at that. Uh, but just the technology that's gone into making those safe is very impressive. And, and people may think that it's a very thin shell, but it's not. It's, it's multiple layers of material that take any kind of mi micrometeorite and will, when it enters, it dissipates. It dissipates the energy and breaks apart the micrometeorite until it you know, it's just powder by the time it gets to any sort of pressure bladder. So we really have protection from the outside as well as burst pressure from the inside. Yeah, let's talk about micro, micrometeoroids for a moment. Um, how would you compare the, uh, the resilience of Vectran versus uh, the Kevlar jackets that they put on um, space station modules these days? You know, com comparison in terms of strength. Well, I, I would probably not be able to give you the greatest detail on the numbers of, about that, but we picked this material because it is superior and it does allow us to accept the high energy particles that do come through you know space and and inevitably will hit our vehicles at some point in time there should be much better than the hard shell vehicles at some point and you know you don't get the uh the cosmic effect of the radiation penetrating through whenever you get you know metal uh hit, hitting the metal and the other particles that come off of that so i think in that respect it's also safer so Vectran has a superior uh, resilience against cosmic rays because you have they have that tendency to split apart and cause more damage as they go through metal. So it's right. 
Yeah, I think so. For the human as well, right? Because we want to avoid as much radiation to the human body as possible while we're up there. We don't have the atmospheric uh, layers to protect us when we're in space. So those layers of material help reduce the amount of radiation that comes into the human body. Okay, let's say, uh, you know, cataclysmic scenario, a micrometeoroid is, is large enough to penetrate. Um, what's the, the patching scenario for Vectran versus a, a metal leak of some kind? That's very similar. We would patch it from the inside, of course, and, and layer that up. It depends on the size. If it's, you know, explosive, right, where it's catastrophic and we can we just have time to get out, we'll just seal the hatch and that will be a loss of the vehicle. If it's a very small you know, penetration, then we will have time to go in and patch that from the inside with multiple layers uh, and, and repair that. We'll do a, a pressure test on it to make sure it's safe. Uh, well, you know, if it's a small hole, we will we'll probably not need protective environment for the person, but if it is very large, we'll have to go in with a, you know, an EVA type suit to do that repair. Another question in regards to it, I'm going to be asking um, Nanorax the same question today. They just, it was just announced that they have a deal with Hilton apparently for the whole space tourism, space hotel kind of thing. Um, how are you, because I know you have an interest in this as well, how do you maintain the security of, you know, another vendor who is, you know, has one life module for all their experiments, you know, secret new polymers that they're making, and then you have tourists in another module. How are you going to maintain that security level? Yeah, we've thought about that quite a bit, and we will be able to seal off certain modules. If a company or a country, say, wants to do their own research and IP work and they don't want other people there, they are free to live and work in the same module. They can you know, do all their food preparation, their exercise, and everything in one module if they feel it's that important to protect the IP. Also, when they leave, we can make sure that no one else can enter their modules. You're right, if we have tourists in another module, uh, then they can be doing their eating, dining, and viewing from that area, and they just, they, that would be an area they were not allowed into. One last question. Um, in regards to one thing that I really haven't had a chance to talk about is those little funny vehicles that you're going to be uh, using for maintenance and transportation, kind of like a spaceship slash space suit hybrid. Can you tell us anything about those? Because I know it's not exactly in your wheelhouse, but do you know anything about them? I don't know a lot about them. That is something that Blue Origin has partnered with, a company that Blue Origin has partnered with. Uh, for my familiarity, I would say we are probably going to continue with an EVA suit, a more traditional design, uh, until we know that that other capability has been proven safe in a lot of different scenarios. So we are still looking to have a backup, like I talked about initially, where we want to have a lot of backups and redundant capability. Uh, that's another area where I want to have a redundant capability. Okay, I lied. One... <laughs> One last question. Um, I understand it's three launches to get the uh, the first station actually in operation. When are you targeting? When do you think you'll be able to actually get this thing up and running, at least the, the, the basic modules? We're targeting 2028. Yeah, and it, I know that's a lot. Uh, we're doing our first Dream Chaser flight this, this coming year, uh, and we're also working on our crude version of Dream Chaser, and that should fly by 26. And then we will have this inflatable module with a node attached, launching in 28. And uh, if we and Blue Origin are, are equal in our, in our schedules and we both get up in 28, then we will make the modules together. But we can bo both be independent as well until the other one arrives. So, geez, <laughs> to clarify, so if there is a holdup with Blue, you can start deploying... Yes, we can launch, we can have our own module, we can have our own power supply. Uh, we agreed as, as the two companies, as partners, that we will not wait for the other one. If we are able to go ahead and launch and get started, we will do that. And as soon as the other person's available, we will, we will join our modules together.
That I did not know. That's a great detail to, uh, to bring to the viewers today. Anything else you want folks to know about what you're doing at the moment? Well, I just watch for Dream Chaser to fly next year and then watch for all the upcoming uh, news about Orbital Reef and the new sciences and the technologies and the, the tourist opportunities for people to fly. It, we are opening it, opening it up to international partners, uh, so it will be a, a very universal type destination. Uh, we want to be as inclusive as possible and diverse as possible with all the different options we can provide. Well, me too. Let me tell you, um, it's, given the fact, you know, in a world where there's a lot of expendable, there's a lot of waste, you guys are all about innovation and reusability. I love what you're doing, and thanks so much for giving us your time today. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So what's the bottom line? Well, I think the only weakness that Sierra Space might have is those inflatable modules. They seem to be a very sound technology. The Bigelow module that's been attached to the ISS for a long time now seems to be very good indeed. But nevertheless, they're putting all their eggs into that basket as opposed to Star Lab, which isn't. But the other weakness that some people might perceive, that is that Blue Origin has never been to orbit yet and they're relying on them. Well, as you may have noticed in the course of the interview, that actually isn't the case. If either Blue Origin or Sierra Space is, finds themselves lagging behind, either company has the option to build Orbital Reef on their own, which I think is very wise for both companies. So really not a lot of weaknesses with this proposal, but nevertheless, Star Lab is very strong as well. And who's the best space station? Who's got it? Well, that is up to you guys. Follow me on Twitter. I'm going to be posting an online poll, and you can make your decision right there. And as always, stay angry about space.